So hello po. Uh, we experience some technical difficulties when it comes to our stream. So we, we are live back again. Sana po ay hindi na po nangyari. So may nangyari po kay YouTube na unexpected. So we are working on it but still habang ito po uh, we are live now. I think we can continue with our stream with our webinar for tonight. So may nangyari lang po na unexpected and I hope na it will not happen again. So we will be continuing. So ita transfer ko na po kay Prof. Cherry to, for her to continue sa ating webinar session for tonight. Okay, so let's continue po. Yeah, so let me just uh, share my screen. Hopefully, this works now. Uh -huh. Sorry. Okay. So, I didn't know kung saan po tayo na-cut off, pero I'll just get right on to the necessary skills to succeed as a distance learner. So, um, earlier I was talking uh, about self-discipline, which is what is necessary. So, according to this, depending on what they are, our habits will either make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. This is um, said by Sean Covey. Now, when we talk about self-discipline, and as I've said, this is the number one thing that is uh, necessary for our, uh, for any student that will enroll in any form of class, actually, uh, for them to be able to succeed. Now, the question is, how do I develop self-discipline? So, as if you've been with us in our um past webinar, which is understanding temperaments, you probably have heard me say that for some temperaments like sanguines, uh, they have the struggle for self-discipline. And because of this struggle, okay, um, there is an and uh, it is necessary for them to control their de daily habits. So for you to be able to dis develop self-discipline, you have to control your daily habits. What does it mean? According to John Maxwell, you'll never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine, which means that it is necessary for us to be to develop um, certain uh, habits for us to become self-disciplined individuals. And it is not impossible. Even if you're a sanguine, it is possible for you or uh, whatever temperaments you might have, it is possible to, for you to develop the right habits for success. And what are these habits, or how do we form a, hab a habit first? So let's let's talk about that. Now, the theory that um, is uh, behind this is known as your fog behavioral model, or your B equals MAP or BMAP theory, which states that behavior happens if motivation and ability and prompt converge at the same moment. What does it mean? For a behavior to be performed, a person should be properly motivated, a person should have the ability to perform that behavior, and there should be prompt to perform that behavior. For us to easily uh, absorb this, let's do this step by step. So this is from Fog Behavioral Model. So how do we form a habit? Okay, for the first uh, first concept is you have to pick a habit you really want to include in your life. Now, it's not an accident that this is the picture that I've chosen because the habit that I want, uh, let me give you a personal example. The habit that I want to include in my life is to wake up early. So this is something that I, especially right now, it's very difficult uh, for you to have your normal body clock, especially um for students or even children who usually uh, sleep very late at night. But it's very important for you to wake up early. So what I do is I pick that habit because I really want to include that in my life. And then after picking that habit, you have to enhance your ability to do the habit. So for example, because I want to, um, to wake up early in the morning, what I did was I adjusted my sleep hours. So I... Uh, so before, my routine was to actually sleep at about 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And then I wake up at about 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. That was uh, starting the, uh, the 
the this pandemic or after the classes have stopped. So um, because of that, I, I've seen that it's very unhealthy and I'm I'm not productive. And because of that, I wanted to change that or to introduce this new habit of wake, waking up early. For me to be able to wake up early, I have to enhance my ability to do that by actually sleeping early. So I adjusted my sleep sleeping time at 10.30 at night so that I will be able to wake up. So for the fifth consecutive day now, I was able to wake up at either 5 a.m., or 6 a.m., 5 to 6 a.m., that's my wake-up time. So the next thing you can do is to break it down into bite-sized pieces. So, for example, you have a habit that you want to start. So for me, it's waking up early. For you, probably, <clears throat> you want to start, let's say, reading. That's a habit that you want to start. So you have to start with uh, a very small portion. Let's say, for example, your number one, uh, first thing that you do to be able to read, let's say, a book, do not put in your, um, let's say, your journal, read uh, a book in seven, seven days. So probably that will be not feasible when you start, when you're still starting the habit of reading. So you probably uh, have this um, idea of just um, your first step will be get uh, or buy a book. And then after you bought that book, open the book to page one. So that is your, or open the book. That is your, that's the step that you want, you would want to have. So if you're able to open the book, then that's already, uh, that's very easy, right? Just open the book. It's very easy. And because it's so easy, you will be able to perform that habit. Now that it will, it will, uh, you can start very small, and then after that, read a couple of pages. Let's say read one page, so uh, or one paragraph if you want. But you have to break it down into smaller pieces so that uh, it does not feel so daunting. Okay, so that is your second step to form a habit. Third is to associate the habit with a trigger. Remember your MAP motivation. Your motivation, that's number one. Pick a habit you really want to include. Then you have your ability. That's number two. Enhance your ability to do the habit by making it very small or a tiny habit so that you can perform the first few steps. And then associate the habit with a trigger. So this is where your prompt comes in. Triggers should be noticeable. For example, alarm. If you want to wake up early, you can alarm your or your set your alarm at let's say 5 a.m. if you want to wake up at 5 a.m. And then another thing that you can do is to actually, when you have your alarm clock, you actually uh, put it in a place where in you have to stand up to actually uh, to to shut the alarm off because if it's like beside you, it, there, is an, uh, there is a tendency for you to just hit the snooze button. And another thing, you can have your a place in your house that triggers your habit. For example, you're trying to develop, let's say, a reading habit. And you have designated a place in your house for reading. So you just place the book there and then do your reading there. So every time that you pass by that portion of your house, you get reminded that, ah, oh, I, I haven't read today, so I should read. So that is another trigger. And then enjoyable activity, which means you have to pair or associate the habit with an activity that you already enjoy. For example, um, for me, I enjoy drinking coffee. So if I would like to form a reading habit, I would usually do it with drinking coffee. So in the morning, um, after, let's say, for example, after I, you know, drink water or after I a uh, shower, then I will get my cup of cup of coffee, and there's a book lying there with my coffee maker, and I would just take that book with me and do some reading. So that is one way for you to be able to form the habit. Another way is for you to celebrate. So immediately after performing the habit, celebrate. So what do I do then? So, um. Because I told you that I was trying to change my circadian rhythm and um, uh, wake up early and sleep er sleep early as well. So every time I'm able to actually wake up early, what I do is um, 
as so I have this habit tracker that I would like, you know, just put a check mark on that day if I'm able to uh to wake up early or do the habit that I'm trying to form. Just putting a check mark and even saying to myself, "Good job, Cherry." So you can you can do that. You you can uh do some positive uh positive talk to yourself or congratulate yourself for being able to perform the habit that you're trying to form. Okay? And lastly, is to track your progress progress. So as I've told you, I have this habit tracker. You can download it if you have um Windows or Android. So I'm using Habit Tracker, uh, which is kind of of cool because it's like it has um some um visuals. And every time that you are able to do a habit, you just click on that if you, you're able to do that for that day. And it will, you know, produce a sound and then um, it will, it tracks your progress of how how long or how uh, how much consecutive days you're able to do the habit you're trying to form. So establish automaticity by re repeating your habit. So if it's a daily habit that you want to form, then um, th usually the first few days or weeks are um the most uh difficult it's like going to the gym for those who've tried uh, going to the gym remember the first few weeks or the first week it's uh, where your muscles are really stretched but you have to and it's there are there is pain like you cannot walk or something and because of uh but if you have to go through that pain um, unless or or else uh, the, the problem with that is if you don't, uh, you know, um, go through that pain, that painful process, uh, you probably will not uh, achieve your goal. And at the same time, um, the next time that you will, for example, you you because it's painful, you stopped. So the next time that you will try it again, there's again that painful first few days or weeks in the gym so but if you're able to pass through that stage where in your muscles are no longer painful uh, when stretch or exercise then um that uh, that you can now continue the behavior because there's no longer pain you know so that is now how to form a habit now there are controversies as to how many days should i consecutively do an activity for it to become a habit. There are, um, you know, a clamor between psychologists and behaviorists. Uh, what is the magic number? But technically, there are no magic magic numbers to this. But um, the truth is, as as you as often as you do the the activity, the more it is ingrained in you and it is formed as a habit. So some would say sixty times. Some would say 21 times. Some would even say 108 times. So it depends on the book that you're reading. So uh, establishing automaticity in the form of habit. Now, for those who are trying to do or to form a habit or to change a bad habit, so obviously there are different uh, bad habits that we have. For example, eating too much sugar, um, you have your eating midnight snacks. Okay. So uh, sorry for for all the eating uh, references. So you probably, it shows what my bad habits are. And then you have your uh, drinking soft drinks. Uh, other bad habits probably will be smoking, drinking alcohol. So you have all this uh, procrastination. You have all this bad habits that that you have and um there is a different way for you to be able to uh you know uh go back you know psychologically and trace the root of that behavior for you to substitute that bad behavior with a good one okay so i want to use this uh this quote um by the author of tiny habits uh, it says here, you change best by feeling good rather than by feeling bad. I, I like that because uh, most of the time when, for example, you, ha you have this goal and let's say you were able to skip or you were not able to perform properly, uh, there is a tendency for us to scold ourselves, right? There's a tendency, tendency for us to, you know, feel bad, feel inadequate and, um, that is actually, that will not help form the behavior or the habit. What will help instead is positive reinforcement. So you will be able to change 
if you feel good about the change that is happening. Uh, for those who are trying to lose weight, right? Most of the effective changes that happen to them is not because they, you know, they hate themselves when they eat. They will only uh, go back to binge eating, you know, or stress eating. But if you like feel good about the changes that has happening that is happening to you, eh, that is the time that um, you know uh, the habit sticks. Okay, so those are the steps on how to form a habit. So next up, we will talk about what are the right habits for me to be able to succeed in this distance learning. So which specific habits should I develop to excel in class? I'm going to give you some of these tips. And this, some of this are actually what I did uh, in my classes. And even as a teacher, these are some things that I do um, for, uh, for my work. Okay, so you can, if you're a teacher and you're here, you can also apply this in your work. You can apply this as a student. You can apply this with your parents. Okay, so first up, wake up early. Uh, John Quick said, it, Jim Quick said, rather, if you can win the morning, you can win the day. We have uh, a lot of productivity, especially in the morning. And you will see that most billionaires, uh, you, if, you, if you are fond of reading or watching their documentaries, one of the secrets that they have is that they wake up early, like 5 a.m. Okay, so some would even... Uh, wake up at 4 a.m. and they would have enough sleep at night. So waking up early is something that can revolutionize, revolutionize your day. So if, if you are able to do this, you know, this is something that I did not know when I was a student because I, I thought of myself as a night person. So I do most of my studying at night. I do most of my cramming at night. So that's why I there is a tendency for me to wake up late and to come to class late. And uh, when that happens, so obviously the uh, it's not as effective, you know. Here in your online classes, there is this greater um, tendency for you to sleep in rather than wake up early. So you have to fight this. You have to change it. Even before the classes begin, you have to change your rhythm. You have to wake up early. How do you do that? You sleep early as well. So you, uh, what I want you to do is to actually, when you're sleeping at night, you have to remove all your gadgets. Now, for parents who are here who are saying that their children, they have, uh, they are having problems with, um, with uh, their children not sleeping early. Well, uh, one of the uh, problem, uh, if that is your problem, one of the things that you can do is to set limits. As parents, you are the ones who make the rules in your homes. So you have to set the limits. For example, 10 a.m., uh, 10 p.m., the internet will be off. So if that is a limit that you set, so it includes you. So your Wi-Fi, if you turn off your Wi-Fi at 10 p.m., it includes you as parents. You also be uh, able to sleep early because if you want your children to sleep early, and that you, the par you parents, are not sleeping early, then how can you ask your children to do that? They will all only say, "Mommy, but you're not sleeping. Na money, you are online, so I want to be online as well." So that is a that will be a problem with you because your children will question your rules if your rules exclude you so you have to sleep with your children early so and then wake up with your kids early you have to practice that because if you don't practice it before the classes begin then you will have problems okay so wake up early next uh once you wake up in the morning uh this is um a routine that some billionaires actually do some leaders top leaders in their field the first thing that they do is to make their beds Okay, so make your bed. So uh, because of the pandemic, because sometimes we are just, you know, lying on our beds every, you know, every time. So there is a tendency for us not to make our bed. So this is uh, one of the habits that you can fo uh, that you can form before the classes begin. Wake up early, make your bed. 
Okay? Drink water, sweat, you know. So these are the things that you can do as you uh, um, try to do this habit. Another habit, the second habit that you have to do to excel in online classes is to create time blocks. What I mean by this is that you have to schedule. Focus is more valuable than intelligence. That's why one of the things that I'll be discussing uh, in this webinar is attention management. Creating time blocks means that you, uh, you are now preventing anything from coming inside the schedule. So if you have uh, if your uh, class schedule is already given to you, you have to put it on a calendar and you have to, you know, show it to everyone in the ho in the home or in your house and your parents and then you have to say that this this is my schedule. So during this time, I'll be studying. Okay, so they will be accountable to you and also you will be accountable to them. Okay, so it means that um, mommy, do not schedule um, going to the groceries with me during this time because this is my class schedule. So do not, uh, you know, put anything in inside that class schedule. So create time blocks or make a schedule. Thirdly, make learning fun. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, prevents us from actually excelling in class is we look at uh, classes as uh, something that is boring. We look, we look at classes as a must do. So, yeah, I need to do this. Yeah, I have to do this. If that is your attitude coming into an online class without passion, can you imagine that when you do online classes, you will learn something new? And this is something that, you know, uh, for me, learning is is a passion. And this, the more you learn, the more you earn. I've heard that from a speaker once. And when I heard that, it really resonated with me. It's true that the more you learn, the more you earn. You become more profitable because knowledge is profitable. It's not just power. It is profit. And it's a commodity. So it is of value. So make learning fun. Make learning profitable. Get everything that you can get from a class. So uh, engage okay, with your professors. Make learning fun again. So that, that, that is the third habit. So have this mindset that I'm going to start this class. I will learn something new today and I cannot wait. Okay, so that is... Ha uh, another habit that you have to do. It's an it's some fo uh, some form of a mindset. Another thing is to give more than what is asked. So this is uh, I know that if you're here and you're from uh, if you have a psychology background, you've heard of this, or you have a sales background, you have probably heard of over delivery. Okay, over delivering or giving more than what is asked is one of the things that they do in sales. So, for example, what they do is it's the concept of under promising but over delivering. And same is true with the class. Don't do the under promising, just do the over delivery. For example, you're in an online class and your teacher asks you, let's say, give two examples. So, in your paper, why not give three or give four? Oh, always give more than what is asked because the teacher who read who will read that will say oh my student is very well read oh my student is very well engaged so for example your teacher asks you uh, create a powerpoint so in your powerpoint don't just create a very simple powerpoint put in pictures put in videos so uh, that is giving more than what is asked of you and if that is your attitude, if that is something that you do, you will always have your professors, your teachers, your um, superiors saying wow. And that, that wow factor that you give into your work or into your classes will, will actually help you achieve what others don't. It says here, to have a life very few have, do the things very few will do. So most people, their attitude to learning nowadays is if they ask you to give one comment on this subject, you give one comment. You just do the bare minimum, okay? Don't do that. 
be the be that person who gives more than what is being asked. Be passionate, you know, like Naruto who wants to be Hokage. Okay, so next is number five: surround yourself with challenging people. You want to succeed in online classes, form a study group. Uh, of course, you cannot do what is seen in the picture, like, you know, come together in a house or in the library. But what you can do is you come together online. And in the study group, include people in your study group who will challenge you, who have the same mindset, who are the ones who, uh, you know, love to, you know, be on time with their projects, with their papers. Don't, you know, don't associate yourself with with uh with your classmates who does the bare minimum as well so if you want to excel in your classes you surround yourself with challenging people your performance rises to the level of your associations kaya nga sabi po tell me who your friends are and i will tell you who you are okay so challenge yourself by surrounding yourself with people who challenge you the sixth point is stop procrastination. One of the key things that you should take away here in this class is stop procrastination. If you want to make an easy job seem mighty hard, this is already to Alan Miller, just keep putting off doing it. Even a simple task can be super duper hard if you if the deadline is let's let's say an hour. Uh, an hour, you know, one hour ago. If that is your deadline, then the, that very simple thing that you kept putting off, you know, will turn into a huge task. But that will give you anxiety. The problem with procrastination is that the more you procrastinate, uh, the more you feel inadequate, the more you feel doubt with yourself. You know, have you ever um, not finished something? You know, you started something and you you did not finish it. Does it doesn't does it made you? Uh, did did it make you feel um, like your your self esteem was very low? Like you were you have this uh, very low self self confidence. If that is something that you felt, you know, uh, that is because you have procrastinated. So how do we combat this? How do I stop procrastination? So let me give you some tips how not to procrastinate okay so these are actually proven tips and if you do this you will no longer procrastinate okay let me give you the first one start somewhere just begin for example you're trying to do a project you have to start somewhere what is the theory behind this it has something to do with what we call as the zygarnik effect um a, psycho a, a, a doctor once saw or observed that uh, the waitress and waiters of a certain restaurant can remember orders from people without even listing them down, like specific orders, like, you know, and they're not writing them down, but they are able to recall them. Um, however, after the meal was already delivered, when they asked the waiters what their orders were, the waiters can no longer remember. So it has, that uh, picked their interest, the doctor's interest, and they experimented on this, that they found out that if you have started something and have not finished it yet, it is left in your memory it's like in the it's in the back of your mind have you ever felt that for example you're going to sleep and there are some some things still unfinished for example the laundry is not yet uh finished or uh you haven't you know and yet and and because of that you cannot sleep because at the back of your mind there's something that i haven't finished yet so we will use this we will uh tap into this for us not to be not to procrastinate we have to start somewhere so for example you have a task that is before you uh, the tendency to procrastinate is because uh the task is too daunting let me give you another step the second step is to break the task down into tiny steps okay let me give you a specific example for example doing your thesis doing your thesis is actually a daunting task. Finish the thesis or do the write-up. It's a very daunting task that uh, because you are scared, you know, to actually start it or to actually do the steps, um, 
you try to put it off. You know, that's what we do when something seems to be difficult. So if you think that it's difficult, we try to avoid it. We try to deny that it exists. But that doesn't go away unless you actually do the task. So for example, you have, let's say you want to do your thesis. So you break it down into tiny steps. Let me give you an example of how to do that. So, so this is your task, finish my thesis. So the first task to finishing the thesis is to actually identify a problem. That's the first task. So you have to know what are you going to uh, do with your research? What is your research problem? So in identifying the problem, you break it down into tiny steps, tiny steps that you're actually able to accomplish. First, go to the library. So in our setup, open my laptop because we, we don't have the library. So probably you have resources on your laptop. So you do open my laptop. Is that difficult? Of course not. Probably your laptops are open right now. So it's so easy. Now that you have done that, you have accomplished the first step to finishing your thesis. Go to the library or open my laptop. So you put there a check mark because you're able to do that. Next, search for peer-reviewed journals. So it, it depends on what type of research you're doing. So you just uh, type in peer-reviewed journals for nursing. And then you'll be able to, you know, find that. And then browse the latest edition. And then here are some of the very, very simple steps. And once you're able to do that, you just put on a check mark as you're able to do this very, very simple step, steps until you're able to identify what problem you will tackle in your thesis. Okay, so I hope that this clears things up. Now, I did not go into detail on how to be able to accomplish this because uh, we will be doing step-by-step uh, -step, um, research uh, or on how to do your research, okay? So uh, that is just a preview of uh, how you do it. Next is to reward your accomplishment. So for example, you set uh, this specific, Task. So if I'm able to have 10 checks for today, 10 check marks on my to-do list or on my uh, task manager, so I'm just going to uh, give myself a prize. So what price will that be? Probably I'll treat myself to a Magnum ice cream. So it's an example of a reward. So because you're able to get that, then you feel good about yourself as you eat that ice cream. I'm able to start somewhere with my thesis. Okay, next up is to come up with your why. It's very, one of the things that will help you uh, stop procrastinating, procrastinating, and this is very powerful, is for you to imagine what will happen if you finished your work. That is what I did because when I took my uh, master's degree, when I was doing my write-ups, uh, when my, I was doing my thesis, I got rejected by the ethics board a couple of times for minor revisions. So I think if I am counting it right, about six, I got rejected six times from the ethics board and four times from my panel. So I got rejected a total of 10 times. So rejection is one of the reasons why we will procrastinate because I don't want to submit it again and then get rejected all over again. However, um, when I was uh, rethinking this, I was thinking I'm not going to finish my master's anymore. But when I was rethinking this, I was envisioning myself with that, uh, so we call it sablay. I was envisioning myself going, uh, you know, dress up in the Filipiniana and then walking on the stage, being, you know, congratulated by a vice chancellor or a chancellor. And, and this actually made me feel so good. And I told myself, now that's my why. I want that. And that can propel you from your procrastination uh, station to your action station. So you have to come up with your why are you doing this? Why should I finish it? What will happen if I finish this? And once you envision that, it can propel you to your action stage. Okay? So... This, uh, that is how habits are formed and what habits to, uh, to actually form for you to be able to succeed. Now we're done with self-discipline. Let's talk about reading skills. 
May I ask you the question, when was the last time you took a course on how to read? When was it? Probably just like this kid, it was when you were in elementary. The problem with us right now is that oh, there are so many reading materials in college, but technically we are not taught how to read. We're taught, you know, um, how to speak, for example, public speaking, but technically we're not taught how to read or the techniques in reading. So um, let me give you some tips on how to enhance your reading skills. The first one is to do active reading. So, for example, once you get your materials from your classes, online classes, probably there are many reading assignments. So you have to do active reading. So what does active reading mean? So first is to underline or highlight keywords and phrases as you read. This is a form of active reading. So it means that you are not just, you know, glancing over the page in, in a daydreaming state. You are actually present, engaging with the book. Next is to make annotations in the margins for question summary or examples. So I'm not sure if you write uh, on your uh, printout. So if you will be given printouts or if you have the printer at home and then you you um, you opt to have a printout so you can do some annotations as you enter the class, you know, as or as you're reading the material. Now, um, if you do not want to, let's say, destroy your textbook by using some or by putting in some notes, you can have... Um, your notebooks uh, together with your reading materials so that you can do some annotations. Next is to test your comprehension. If you're, uh, this is one of the uh, techniques that I do for me to be able to recall or for me to test if I'm able to recall what I just read. So for example, I read a section of the textbook and then after I, I time myself, for example, uh, I'm going to give myself two minutes to read this. After two minutes, so I have a timer. After two minutes, I will close that page and then have a blank piece of paper beside me and just write down everything I remember from that page. So that is one thing that you can do to test your comprehension. Another thing is for you to, to teach it to someone else. Explain what you've read to someone else. So, so uh, one of the uh, gauges that you are able to really understand a concept is if you're able to teach it to someone else. So do active reading. Another way of doing active reading, especially for reading assignments or, um, you know, textbooks, is doing what we call as your SQ3R method. SQ3R method. Now, the SQ3R method... Um, involves the first one. I think the first part is very helpful. It has something to do with survey or skimming over your material. So, for example, you have you were given, um, uh, let's say, a reading assignment or, let's say, a textbook. So, the first thing that you should do is to go over the table of contents or skim over the materials so that you know where you can find some concepts or where... Um, so, so that you know what concepts or what is this uh, reading material all about. So usually you can find that in the headings, in the subheadings. So that is one thing that you can do, survey or skim it first. Then you have here your question of who, what, where, when, and how. So this is uh, usually done for, for example, you have some reading comprehension materials for your English subjects. So these are the things that you have to Note who are the characters, what is the plot, or uh, where where is it, you know, where is the story happening, when is the time. Okay, so these are the questions that you have to do. And then read, simply read. Remember, so when you talk about remembering, it has something to do with uh, what I told you earlier. So you test your comprehension and then review is now that you have skimmed over this, now that you have uh, tested your comprehension, there are things that you have forgotten. So you have to review them. Okay, so that, that is doing active reading. Another way to enhance your reading skills is to keep an active book list. Now, uh, your book list can be, uh, can contain what you must read, 
which include your textbooks and reading assignments and your pleasure read list, which means those things that you want to read for fun or for your own pleasure, like some novels or love stories, some manga, some self-help books. So this, uh, if you have an active book list, so at least you know that these are the books that I need to read now. And make sure that your list is actually visible to remind you that, oh, I have to read, okay? Next is schedule your reading time. If it's not scheduled, it, it usually is not done. And uh, if you are not fond of doing some scheduling on your, uh, on your phones or in a calendar, um, you will have problem with time management when it comes to online classes. So this is something that you have to do. You have to place in your schedule time for reading if you want to enhance your reading skills. Because these are skills, which means the more you do it, the more you become better at it. So it says here, choose a time where your brain is most active. Some of you are evening people. Some of us are even morning people. So if you're a morning person, there's a tendency for you to have your peak brain activity during the day. So you can time your reading uh, or you, you can schedule your reading time during the day. Or if you're, uh, you know, mostly a reader who's awake in the evening, so you can do your reading time uh, during the evenings. And then I've already said this, pair the reading with a pleasurable activity like drinking coffee or even resting. Okay. Now, another thing that you can do to enhance your reading skills is to try out speed reading. Um, speed reading is uh, the, the, use, the average uh, num words per minute the person can read is about 110 to 150. It's also the average words per minute that you can speak. So one of the things that you can do is to test your baseline speed. So how do you do that? So if you have, let's say, a book. So let me just uh, get a book here. So, okay, so you just get a book and then you get your timer and then put uh, put a one minute timer and then you just read. So once the timer begins, timer starts now. So you have 60, 60 seconds and then you read. So after you read, you just, after the alarm stops, one minute, you just count the number of words that you're able to read during that span of time. So for example, usually uh, in a book, there are 10 words per line. So you just count the number of lines that you were able to finish and then multiply it by 10. And that is your baseline speed, your words per minute. Now, if you want to improve your reading skill in terms of speed, what you do is you use a visual pacer. Um, a visual pacer, as you know, your eyes are attracted to movement or motion. That's why, for example, you are doing a webinar and something, you know, um, someone just walked past you, your eyes are actually attracted to that and you move your eyes to that movement. Okay, so uh, because our eyes follow motion. So what you do is either you open it and try this out. So after you get your baseline, you do your visual, uh, your, your reading with a visual pacer. You can use your finger and just trace it. So you time again yourself and then do your reading. Now, after that, you compare. Usually, with a visual pacer, you can use your finger or you can use your pen to do that. That will actually uh, prevent what we call as regressions. Regressions happen when, for example, you're reading a textbook. And um, I don't know if this happens to you. Um, after reading a line, you forget, did I read that line already? So you go back to that line that's called regression because your eyes are not focused. But if you have a finger or a a pen tracer, what you can do is you just, uh, you know, move it along and your eyes will move with it. So it somehow reduces what we call as your regression, wherein you have to recheck and check what line am I in right now. So that is called your visual pacer. 
And another is to actually give yourself some time when you read a chapter or a section. As I've told you earlier, one of the techniques that I do is I just time myself. So, for example, I'm reading this. This is my, let's say, textbook. This is the page that I'm working on or the disease that I'm studying. So I'm just going to give my time, let's say, five minutes to read this. Then when the time is up, I'm just going to put it down, blank piece of paper, write everything that I have memorized from that page. And that is uh, one thing that you can do to increase your comprehension even while speed reading, okay? So the problem with uh, when you read textbooks, especially the fact-heavy ones, like for us in nursing, because uh, these are medical textbooks or, you know, you're reading fact-heavy uh, psychological books or whatever uh, books you're reading, science. So when you're doing that, uh, there is a tendency for you to... Um, uh, to, for your brain or for you to read very slowly. And when you read very slowly, because you're trying to comprehend, right? You're trying to comprehend. Because um, remember when you were when we were young, when, for example, we read something and then there is a question uh, about what we've read and we don't know the answer. It means we were not able to comprehend what we've read. Our teacher will tell us or our parents will tell us to read again the passage, but this time slowly. But actually, that's a problem. Once you read a passage very slow, there is a tendency for your brain to wander because, you know, it's so slow. It's like speaking. For example, when I'm speaking to you and I'm saying, use a visual pacer, example, pen or finger. So if I'm doing that, Right, you get bored. Your attention go elsewhere. Your mind go goes elsewhere. So uh, that's the problem. So if you're trying to read something, that's also why sometimes cramming works when you just have a couple of time. You know, you there is a specific time for you to uh, understand a certain concept. So sometimes no, I'm not gonna say it will work, but sometimes it works. So you time yourself. Okay, so when you read a chapter, so there is this uh, um, end to your uh, to your reading, and then you have a test. So test yourself. Okay, so that is how you enhance your reading skill. Next one is how do we enhance our note taking skills? Okay, very. This is I'm gonna go at this very fast. Okay, so because we had some a uh, couple of setbacks on our technicals no so let's talk about how to take notes first is to prepare your tools what tools do you need so when you're going to class and you're going to online classes you have to make sure especially if your parents are here listening as well if your parents and you have kids going to online classes you have to make sure that they are prepared for the online class that, that it is really a class you know they are not just sitting on their beds and just you know ha uh, having their earphones and then you know playing their mobile legends or whatever their the kids are playing nowadays so, or watching Netflix on the background. So, please, please, please make sure that they are actually, uh, they feel that they are in the classroom. So, what does it mean? When you're in a class, what do you do? When the professor is speaking, when there is a lecture, you have to take notes. So, when you take notes, you have to have the right tools. So, I know a couple of classmates, you know who goes to class with nothing, nothing but their ID and their wallet and their phones. Okay, so I don't know how you do that because you don't have a bag where your notes or your notebooks or your pens are located. So when you take notes, you can either use your notebooks, so it will be handwritten notes, or your laptop. So many are asking which is more effective. Is it the notebook or is it the laptop? So uh, the two of this, uh, uh, actually, each has its own advantage. So if you're using handwritten notes, uh, it has a better memory advantage. It has a memory advantage wherein the recall is better if you write it down. Of course, you're using more senses than uh, when you are just merely typing it. For laptops, when you use laptops to, let's say, make your notes, 
there is what we call a sir, speed advantage because it is faster when you uh, when your professor is speaking so you have the speed advantage to actually say or rather type what the what the, your uh, professors are speaking and if it's digital you can actually do some search on it however uh, the problem with uh, laptops, laptop note takers is that they have the tendency to take notes word per word. And that's not how you do uh, note taking. Note taking should be paraphrased or should be in your own words. Um, sometimes my professor, when I was in, uh, in college, my professor will discuss a topic and um, there is this definition. It's so elaborate. But in my notes, it will just be uh, the Tagalog uh, phrase or something that will, you know, enhance my my memory about that that disorder. Okay, so that is um, that is one thing that you can do. Okay, then you have to have your favorite pen. If you're doing your note taking uh, handwritten, so have your pens ready, have your highlighters or your rulers ready, so that you can take good notes. Secondly, look at your syllabus. It pays to read ahead to anticipate what topics uh, will be discussed during that session. Usually, the syllabus is given at the beginning of the class. So you already know what the topic would be during that week's session. So it pays to read ahead so that you know what, uh, what uh, sections will be discussed by your teacher or what subjects will be discussed. Thirdly is paraphrase. As I've told you, do not write the professor's uh, words or the professor's lecture word for word. Uh, because if you do this, uh, there will no, uh, there will be very little memory, uh, especially if you're doing handwritten notes. You will, uh, if, you're, if your professor speaks fast, just like I, I do, I speak fast, it will be very difficult for you to get everything that she's saying. So you have to have your system. You have to paraphrase. Okay, so you can put in Tagalog words. You can put in some doodles there or, or uh, some keywords. So like your bullets, examples, or definitions. So you have to paraphrase. And so when you do your note-taking, there are several styles that you can use. These are the three styles that I can uh, give you. So you have your outline method, you have your cornell method, and you have your mind mapping. These are the three most common styles of note-taking. The first one is our outline method. So when you do your notes, you probably do the, it like this. So it's very organized. So you have a main idea, which is usually number one. Or for some, it's no, uh, Roman numeral one. And then you have your uh, concept that is, let's say, a subtopic of your main idea. And then you have the details of that subtopic. For example, definition or, you know, I don't know. So examples. So you, this, are, this is the outline method. And for most people, this is the type of note-taking that they did in high school and even in college because this is i think this is the one that is being taught another style is known as your cornell method now cornell method has three it, it allows us to divide our notes or notepads into three parts so the first part the larger part is known as your note taking area so this is that part and then you have your q column Okay, and you have your summaries or summary. So what happens here is uh, when you are on your class, e everything will be written in the note taking area. So it could be like an outline style uh, set up in the note taking area. And then in the Q columns, you will write there mostly the main ideas. Okay, and then after the class, you will write your summary. Okay, so let me give you a filled up example of the Cornell method. As you can see here, so during the class, you place your uh, your uh, notes here. So you have your bullet points, abbreviations, paraphrasing. Okay, and then here, soon after class, you write the cues. For example, anticipated exam questions. Now, as a teacher, I usually give a hint if this question is or this topic is important and that the, the student should read on it or take notes. So there are some syntax that your teachers will say 
And you have to actually listen to that. For example, your teacher will say, take note, okay? For, or uh, your teacher will say, this will come out of the exam. <laughs> so that's very obvious. So you put it there. And then uh, this can be, the cues can be used for review and study. And then you have your summary, which is usually written after class, as we've said, which briefly summarizes everything on the page. Okay, so that is known as your Cornell method. It's nice, right? So maybe you would want to try this one. Next is the mind mapping. Okay, so the mind mapping method, so you have your main topic in the middle and you have some subtopics that branch out, as you can see here. So, for example, you have your main, uh, let's say, for example, your teacher is discussing a specific disease. So you have that disease there and then there are so, some branching out, let's say, like risk factors. And then you have like uh, more branching out. And, you know, this is uh, another note-taking skill. Usually, this um, is very effective for visual learners. This is effective only if you have some colors with it, some doodles, some images, some form of highlighting what is quite important, as you can see in this illustration. So this is known as the mind mapping method. So another uh, another style that you would uh, probably encounter is your own style. Okay, so as for note-taking styles, you can combine your outline method with your Cornell or your mind mapping with a flow chart style or diagrammatic style of note-taking. Make it your own. Make it your signature. There, are, I know a lot of a lot of my classmates before, especially the melancholics. Uh, they have really good penmanship. Okay, so they had they write very well, and it's it's so easy to photocopy their notes, right? But um, if you do that, you miss out on your uh, chance to include that note taking uh, that you are doing into your memory when you do memorize your uh, your concepts. Okay, so please do the note taking styles. It can be online or rather digital or it can be handwritten personally i prefer handwritten i don't know because probably because i am a millennial which means that i belong to this to the age uh where we know analog and we know digital but for the generation z genzers i don't know prob probably sir kenneth will give us some points on how they do so uh note taking or you know how they uh, go about in their studies Okay, so fourthly, we have our listening skills. So we have, uh, when we talk about listening skill, how, the question that comes into mind is how can I improve my listening skills? Sometimes you will be part of a class wherein your internet uh, access will not um, support a video or a face-to-face -face, uh, face -face, uh, conference. So when that happens, you have to listen in a podcast or through audio only. And when that is the, when, when that's the case, you have to know how to listen properly. So let me give you some tips on how to improve your listening skills. So you have a, a mnemonic and this is your heart. Okay, so this is an acrostic. So HEART stands for, the first thing to listen effectively is HALT. HALT means to stop. Stop everything that you're doing and just focus on what you are listening to. Okay, so the multitasking is a myth. Okay, what we are doing is actually task switching. There is no multitasking. So if you want to really listen effectively, stop what you're doing. Um, have you ever experienced talking to someone who is, let's say, on their phone or doing something else with their attention not on you? Does it hurt? Of course it does. Because you feel that that person does not listen to you uh, effectively or doesn't listen to you um, as much as you want them to. So halt or stop what Ever you're doing. Letter E is engage. When you're when you want to listen effectively, you have to engage your listener. Empathize with your listen. Uh, empathize with sorry with the one who is speaking. With uh, 
if your professor is speaking, engage with the conversation. For example, the teacher asks a question. Usually in online classes, it's very difficult to be a teacher during online classes. You know why? Because you will ask a question and no one would respond. Obviously, everyone probably is muted so that you cannot hear the rooster crowing or the dogs barking or their mother nagging. <laughs> Just kidding. So, but then again, um, you have to engage. For example, your professor asks you, um, uh, so what do you think is a chuva chuva chuva? Okay, so that's the question. Then you have to engage, unmute your mic, and then respond. Because that tells your professor that I'm here, ma'am, I'm listening. Okay, so that's an, uh, one way of listening effectively. Another is to anticipate. Anticipate what you what the speaker is going to say do you know how us teachers know that you're actually listening to us if you're able to anticipate what we're going to say for example uh, we are you know building into a sentence and then you can actually join us at the end of the sentence meaning that you have anticipated where the conversation is going then that means you are actively listening and that uh, that is a plus point for your recitation letter r means review for you to be able to listen uh, effectively uh, one of the things that you need to do is to be able to review what the person has or summarize what the person has just stated okay and the lastly take notes one way to listen effectively is for you to take notes because you um it's i remember a quote once it says the dullest the dullest pencil is mightier than the sharpest memory or is better than the sharpest memory because the um if you have written it down there is a greater chance of recall as opposed to you just hearing the the words okay so it's it's good for you to jot down especially for concept heavy uh, fact heavy subjects okay so this is your heart how to listen effectively okay study skill we are at the end of uh the we are the last topic of our webinar i'm just checking on our time okay so how to study effectively I'm breaking this down into two concepts. First is attention management. Secondary. Second is your memory enhancement. When we talk about attention management, let's first define what attention means. Attention is the process of focusing your cognitive resources on one particular stimulus while ignoring all others in the environment. That is attention. So <clears throat> when you do what you think is multitasking, Okay, multitasking. Um, it's not actually multi multitasking. It's actually called uh, task switching. So when you do task switching, there is a tendency for you to, let's say, for example, you, you're listening to a lecture like this one. And then um, you decided to, I don't know what you're doing right now, eat your eating or another mental activity, you're watching Netflix. Okay, so when you do that, you are not actually multitasking. What you're doing is you are switching your focus from one thing to the next thing, then again to the next thing. However, your problem with that is that because your whole focus is not on just one thing, there is a tendency that uh, you will have what we call as the directed attention fatigue. The directed attention fatigue happens when you are trying to focus all your cognitive resources on one thing for a long period of time, and then you do some form of switching your task. So you need to focus on one thing at a time. So if you have online classes, just focus on the online class and not on other things so how do we manage our the, your how do you manage your attention during online classes number one design study only zones i really love this picture right here uh, wherein there is this uh there is this greenery and there are these books and <clears throat> you have this well-lit, well-lit, well-ventilated space you have your laptop there so it's like 
you know, it's a very good study-only zone. When I talk about designing your study-only zones, um, if you have, in, in your house, if you're preparing for online classes for your children, you designate an area as much as possible, the less distraction, okay, possible in that area. Not noisy, okay, so well-lit, well-ventilated, and you, you set up that area for study-only area okay and then after you've de designated now oh, this is the study only zone the next thing that you should do is to remove non-essentials from your study zones what do i mean by that anything that will not help you in your study remove it so during online classes if you're um obviously it's online class you need your internet access so if you are, let's say, online, you have to turn off other apps. Your social media account, log out, log it out, um, whatever, uh, anything that can get your attention, log it out or block it. There are actually um, some apps on your phones right now that will close off other other apps when you are in your study mode, okay? So remove all non-essentials non from your study zones. Third is stop multitasking. I already said that because when you change um, things that you're doing, it is actually, uh, it le leads you to fatigue. Another is that it leaves what we call as your attention residue. When you talk about your attention residue, it has something to do with if you're doing something earlier, um, and then, for example, you have a task A. Task A, let's say you are, what, what is task A? Let's say you're watching Naruto, right? And then your task B is your, in your online class. So watching Naruto and then online class. And then watching Naruto and then online class. Um, attention residue happens when after you've watched Naruto and then go to your class, uh, some of your some of the some some of your brain cells, your attention is still focused on Naruto, despite of the fact that you're already trying to focus on your online class. So I hope that you're getting what I'm trying to say here. Okay, the fourth is have a study jam or a study playlist, usually instrumentals. So I suggest you look for um, study session playlist on Spotify. There are actually uh, several playlists there, or you can use classical music. And once you play that music in the background, as you are studying, it will help you focus your attention to that one thing that you're, for example, reading, because it usually drowns out all the other noise or all the other distractions because you have this like you know study jam and somehow if you have one playlist that you keep on you know once that it's on you know you are now conditioning yourself to uh do the study the, the i mean to study for example if you have let's say this playlist of instrumentals do not Put in your playlist uh, songs with lyrics because the lyrics will interfere, will add to your, uh, will get your attention. So just folk, uh, just use instrumentals. Now, if you're studying, um, if once that you do this for a couple of times, uh, when you hear that sound, it already, you know, tells your brain, oh, it's time to study. It, it puts you on that sphere of studying, okay? So have your study jam or study playlist. And number five is take study breaks. Remember the fatigue that I was talking about. An attention fatigue happens, so most people can only get a couple of um, minutes studying. For example, 25 to 30 minutes study, and then after studying, they need to take a break. Uh, if you're utilizing what we call the Pomodoro technique of studying, you can do that. So Pomodoro is 25 minutes study and then five minutes break. So usually in the five minute break, 
that they take it's usually something physical it's either they walk or you know they do coffee break or tea break or you know they do the, some sweating or something active playing the piano so during your study breaks so it will help actually retain more of what you're studying okay so that is your attention management tips next the next thing that we'll talk about the last thing actually in our slide is known as your memory enhancement tips are you still with us okay so i hope you are okay so this is um uh these tips will actually help enhance your memory your quick recall that's the reason uh, so quick recall so how do you practice active recall okay before we do that let's check your active recall okay so let's have a check so huh how can i see you i guess i need to turn it off right so uh what uh, I'll I'll just stop sharing so that I can see you guys. Okay. Yes, you're there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. So um, let's check your active recall right now. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of. Uh, I'm gonna tell you ten words, and then um, you you are not allowed to write anything. Okay. Just from your memory, from listening to me, from your memory. I want you to try to recall them later. Okay, no writing of anything. Just listen to the these uh, different words. Okay, let me begin. Okay, 10 words, 10 objects, okay, <laughs> or whatever. Okay, so fire hydrant, balloon, batteries, barrel, wild boar, carbon paper, night, Ox, toothpaste, sign. Okay. So from those 10 words, I want you now to write, you can write down on the piece of paper or on the comment section below, what are the words that you remember? I'm not going to repeat it again. What are the words that you remember from the 10 words that I have just said? Okay, I'm gonna give you some time. Oh, as many as you can remember, okay? <laughs> so I think, oh, nice. Okay, good, good. Okay, good. Okay, so how many of you remembered fire hydrant fire hydrant okay probably most of you remembered fire hydrant how many of you remembered sign sign if you remembered fire hydrant okay it is the first remember it's the first word that i told you fire hydrant and then for example you remembered balloon fire hydrant balloon so if you remembered fire hydrant it's called what we call as your primacy. Primacy. When we study something, we usually remember the first thing that we studied. And if you recall the word sign, how many of you recalled sign? If you recall the word sign, it is because, um, you know, you are remembering the last word. Okay? We call that recency. So the last thing that was said, you remembered. Recency. How many of you remembered the word balloon, batteries, barrel? If you remember these three, because they are all letter Bs, has something to do with your grouping. So when, uh, when something is grouped together, it is uh, easily remembered. Okay? So um, some of you remembered the word night. Sorry for who, who remembered wild boar. Wild boar probably some of you remember that because that is, um, as you know, something that stands out. You know, something that stands out is remembered easily. So, how many of you remembered all ten? Okay. So if you did not remember all ten, let me give you a technique for you to be able to remember all ten. 
And this is uh, one of the techniques that we do. And I've learned this, this from Jim Quick. It's the test of um, visualization. So, for example, I want you to visualize this. I want you to visualize a fire hydrant. Okay, fire hydrant. So you know this. This is the color yellow, right? That is used by uh, firemen, right? When when there there is fire. Okay, so remember the fire hydrant, and in the fire hydrant there is a balloon. Okay, there is this balloon tied to the fire hydrant, and this balloon. I want you to think about the color of the balloon. What color is the balloon? What color? What color is the balloon? Fire hydrant, and then a balloon. What color is the balloon? Okay, so let's say red. I love red. So there's a, there's this balloon or whatever you said that that balloon is red. Now I want you next to me, to to visualize that there are batteries, okay, batteries coming towards the balloon. You know, it's flying towards the balloon, that that big balloon. So there's a fire hydrant and then there's this balloon and there are batteries, you know, soaring from the sky. And, you know, trying to get that balloon. And then when you look down and then when the batteries are, are coming up, you know, you look at the batteries. What, what is the brand of the battery? What is there something reading? There's a brand of the battery. So these batteries are now coming up to the balloon trying to, uh, trying to explode the balloon. And then when you look down you saw that the batteries came from somewhere. It's a barrel. It's a barrel. Okay, so there's a barrel in the ground from where the, the batteries came from. Okay, once you look at the barrel, okay, what color is the barrel? Maybe brown because it's made of wood. Okay, when you look at the barrel, there is, there is a logo on the barrel. And that logo is a logo of a wild boar. There's a logo in the barrel. It's a logo of a wild boar. Okay. Now, as you're looking, okay, you're looking at the logo, at the barrel with the logo, the wind blew. And there is this crumpled carbon paper. If you're if you're a millennial, uh, or rather, if you're a Gen Zer, probably you don't know what carbon paper is. I don't know. <laughs> it's not judging, but do you still have typewriters? Okay, so uh, carbon paper. So for those who know carbon paper, you know you you do that to triplicate your to triplicate your your uh, typing. Okay, so or duplicate your typing. So there's uh, this piece of carbon paper that flew by. Okay, as you're watching the wild boar in the barrel or in the logo. And then as it flew by, there is this night. And that night is not night meaning tonight. It's a night, K-N-I-G-H-T. Okay, and that night, okay, the night is actually supposed to be riding a horse. But the night is not riding a horse. The night is riding an ox. Okay. The knight is riding an ox. Okay. So when when the knight looked at his ox, the the ox's breath stinks. So the knight pulled out a toothpaste. The knight pulled out a toothpaste and just brushed the ox's teeth. And then the knight, after brushing the Pulling out the toothpaste, the knight threw the toothpaste out. Now, the toothpaste, before he threw it out, the toothpaste has a brand. What is the brand of the to toothpaste? I want you to see it. What is the brand of the toothpaste? Okay. And then, I don't know. I don't want to, you know, this is not product placement. So, <laughs> next is the knight threw that toothpaste into a sign. Okay. Into a sign. What is written on the sign? What is written on the sign? You decide. Okay. Now, now let's try if we will be able to, you know, to remember the, the 10 because of our visualization. Okay. So the first one, there's a fire hydrant. Next, balloon. 
Third, there were batteries. Fourth, there was a barrel. Fifth, there's a logo in the barrel, wild boar. Sixth, there is a carbon paper that flew by. Right? Seventh, there was a knight. Eighth, there was an ox. Ninth, bad smelling, toothpaste. Ten, sign. Now, this time around, how many of you are able to remember these words? Now, let's try this one. If you are able to remember it from fire hydrant to sign, can you remember it backwards? Can you remember it from sign to fire hydrant? Let's do it backwards. There's a sign. There was a toothpaste. There was the ox. There was the knight. There was the carbon paper. The wild boar. The barrel. The batteries. The balloon. And the fire hydrant. Were you able <laughs> to get all 10 even backwards? That is the power of visualization. Now, let's try it on first size. Let me ask you this question. Uh, in, the, in high school, for example, in high school classes, what are the fact-heavy classes? Fact-heavy classes for high school students. Usually in your gen ed subjects, it will be probably science, right? It will be science. And if, you're talk if we're talking about uh, science, um, what do you memorize in science? Maybe you memorize in science um, scientific names, uh, biological terms. But one of the things, let's say chemistry, one of the things that you memorize is your periodic table, right? So this is one of the things that you memorize. And how many of you have memorized the periodic table? For example, the periodic here, hydrogen, helium. Lithium, beryllium, boron. Okay, so you have carbon. You have um, you have your nitrogen, oxygen. You have your fluorine. You have your uh, neon. Okay, so if we're talking about this periodic table of elements, you know, some of you will have your mem memories, but uh, some of you probably have memorized them. So let's just say the first ten elements of the periodic table. Let's try to remember them. So, ma'am, how can I remember them? It's quite easy, okay? Let's say your hydrogen stands for something. Let's say something that sounds like hydrogen, like your hydrant, fire hydrant, okay? Next, let's say your helium stands for something. What's inside a balloon? It is helium, right? And then, what is lithium? What represents lithium? Batteries. Batteries. What about sometimes when you don't know what represents it, so what sounds like it? So, batteries came from barrel. So, it sounds like beryllium. Beryllium, right? Barrel, beryllium. Now, there was a boar. A boar in the barrel. So there's a logo of a wild boar, boron. That's the next element, boron. And there is this carbon paper that flew by, carbon. Carbon is the next element. Next, there was a knight, a knight that stands for nitrogen. And there was, the knight was riding an ox. The next element is oxygen. Then the ox has a bad breath, so you use a toothpaste. Toothpaste for fluorine. And there was a sign. Probably that sign was neon. Neon sign. And that's neon. With association and visualization, you can now memorize your 10 elements. Let's try it. What's the first one? Hydrogen. Fire hydrant, right? Second one. Balloon. Helium. Third. Lithium for batteries. Fourth. Beryllium for barrel. Fifth. Boro, boar, wild boar, boron. Six, carbon. 
it's carbon paper floating by. Night, it's nitrogen that's riding an ox, oxygen. That has a bad breath, you need toothpaste, fluorine. And you have the sign, neon. So you will be able to memorize that using visualization and association. Let me get back to my screen now. Okay, so there you go. So you can practice active recall. You can quiz yourself. You can convert concepts to pictures just like what we did. Now you can memorize your uh, different elements of the periodic table. And then you can do what we call a spaced repetition. This is reviewing what you just memorize. So for example, this memory tip is very uh, effective for you. Okay, so some of you are commenting that it's very effective. So you can probably do this a couple of times and then it will be ingrained in your memory. And then what you can do is activate other senses. Um, one of the things that you can do to memorize certain stuff, as I've told you, is to listen to a jam, a study jam like classical, or you can, you know, activate other senses or like chew a flavor of a gum, different flavor for, let's say, different concepts or different subjects. It helps you activate your senses to just, you know, put in that memory and, um, you know, uh, concretize it in your brain. Now, it's also important that after you study is you have a good night's sleep. Because when you sleep, um, your everything that happened to you or the things that you read will be part of your dreams. And that is, in turn, will become long-term memory. Have you ever had that? For example, you watch a movie. Uh, for example, you watch Divergent uh, last night. You replayed Divergent, and then when you slept, you felt that you are dauntless or you know abnegation. I don't know, but it somehow happens that what we dream of usually is what we did or you know what we read before we go to sleep. Okay, so it's in our subconscious. Now let me end this webinar with this uh, quote from Galileo Galilei. I have never met a man so ignorant that I couldn't learn something from him. This is a man who discovered the telescope, who you know made leaps in uh, leaps in uh, astrology, astronomy. So Galileo uh, is a, a man who is passionate about learning. It doesn't matter who is in front of him. He learns. He's passionate about it. And that's the reason uh, why we are actually doing this because we are also passionate about learning. We are passionate to uh, have uh, the students excel in their classes and also have the parents uh, journey with the students, with their children uh, in this online class. So let's take every opportunity to learn from other people. There's no, just like Galileo Galilei, there's no stopping to learning. There's no teacher that's so ignorant that you cannot learn. Even your worst teacher, you learn something from them. So if you like this webinar, please do not forget to um, subscribe to our channel and also uh, to the channel of Sir Ken. Thank you so much uh, for hosting us. Thank you so much for being with us. So thank you po, uh, Prof. Cherry, for being with us for that very insightful webinar. Okay, so uh, I think we have, I think, time for two questions. Uh, hindi ko na po siya hanapin dito sa comment section. I, I wrote down two questions while we're having our webinar. Meron pong dalawang nagtanong. And then uh, from Arlene Garcia, ang tanong niya po is, can you help us with some strategies which we can do to help our slow learners. For slow learners for ito, whose parents <clears throat> has same situation like their children. So slow learners po, and then uh, yung uh, parents also have those struggles din po sa pagtuturo sa mga bata. Okay. So um, understandable po na hindi pareho ng uh, ng face, uh, sorry, ng pace rather, ng pace ang ating mga students in terms of absorbing their materials no? uh, or different um, uh, learning uh, methods natin. So I think um, when you have, like, let's say, for example, parents who are not uh, um, also... Uh, what do you call this, parang well-versed dun sa materials na uh, na kailangan nung kanilang mga anak, it 
it puts pressure on the professors or on the teachers to do some extra effort for the students. And um, siguro po isa sa mga pwede natin magawa is what we call as your learner support. Um, learner support is, these are, uh, um, you can give, let's say, some online class time for those who have difficulty, let's say, learning a subject, like you will give them time to review, and at the same time, a uh, time to have a one, a personal, um, what do you call this, time with you online. So that can uh, that can be arranged, po siguro. Considering na meron po uh, available po sila doon sa ano, available po sila sa online, may access sila. Okay, po. So last question na po siguro for tonight. So from Angelica Elasion, so what tips could you give to students in reading during online classes on desktop or phone? Kasi po, uh, marami sa mga sadyante nasa gadgets and then mm -hmm. uh, ano po daw po yung practical na pwedeng maibigay if we are reading, ang gamit po natin ay yung phone or yung computers po natin. Okay, so uh, when you do reading in uh, using your, let's say, your gadgets, uh, you probably can ho uh, get hold of apps that allows you to take notes of uh, digital or um, yung mga pwedeng mag-annotate. For example, you're reading uh, an e-book or a textbook. So something that can uh, do some highlighting or editing. Uh, I think PDF, yung Acrobat Reader, possible yun. No? Yung mag-annotate, tapos maglagay ng mga comments on the side. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if meron pang mga apps that are given for free. Or, 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 or are free na pwede yung magamit. Okay po. So, uh... I hope those answer the question that were given. So, dalawa na lang. Pasensya na po. Uh, we will be answering other questions na lang po through PM. Message niyo na lang po ako or si Prof. Cherry sa if you have questions pa po since we are running out of time. Uh, yes, thank po. you po for everyone for certificates. Andito po uh, for certificate HTTPS uh, colon, tama po ba to? Backslash and then tiny URL slash practical distance. So, ito po ang evaluation form natin for you to receive a digital certificate. And then, para naman po for those people na medyo nagbabagal, so, kinoconsider din po namin ni Prof. Cherry yung mga uh, teachers, parents, and students that gusto pong makakuha ng kanilang certificate, pero medyo nahihirapan po sa connection, medyo mabagal. So, binabasa ko po yung comments. Meron po mga nagbabrowsing, nagbabuffering. So, <laughs> ayan po. Uh, as our we will be opening our evaluation form for three days. Pwede nyo po, available po yun sa YouTube. So, check nyo lang po sa this YouTube channel. And then, pwede rin po update sa Everyday Learner. And then, for after three days po, i-close po muna namin yung pamimigay ng certificates para ah, yung pagtanggap ng responses for certificates para mag-start na po kami magbigay. And then, for those team replay, so meron po tayong hashtag team replay. So ang pa replay password po natin is quick recall. Ayan po. So for three days, bukas po yung ating evaluation. And then for replay password, we have quick recall. So ayan po. So Prof. Cherry, any final insights and thoughts para po sa ating viewers for tonight? Okay, so for those who are with us who are asking for English translations of what we are saying, so uh, Sir Ken uh, just said that uh, certificates uh, will, e-certificates will be provided um, uh, if you answered our evaluation form with the links that he has uh, showed you and uh, he will also give chance to those, uh, to others who are not yet with us who uh, registered on this uh, webinar. So there will be a replay and we'll open the e-certificates e for three days and then give out uh, the, cert uh, the certificates to the participants. Now, for those who are asking if it's okay to post this on YouTube, it's uh, or rather on FB. Yes, ma'am, it's okay. If you, can, if you can share it with your friends or with uh, others, it will be our honor to provide uh, this material to them. Um, for those who are asking for um, material, a copy, a PDF copy of the materials, you can uh, probably go to our Facebook page, uh, Everyday Learner, and uh, we will create a group soon. 
Okay, we will create a group soon where we can um, upload some of the materials that we're using for uh, our webinar. So thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much, Sir Ken. Please subscribe to his channel, STEM Teacher PH. Um, he provides a lot of uh, tutorials there. For those who are upcoming um, Google uh, learners and also teachers, uh, you might want to uh, get your uh, trainings with him. So thank you so much for being with us, everyone. Um, Yes, we have a couple of viewers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry for the sure. uh, for the YouTube. Um, uh, I don't know what happened there. So, okay. So we hope that you understand something new today. Keep on learning. This is Everyday Learner. God bless everyone.